Hello, we're Andy, the maniacal cinephile, and today we're heading back into the chilling world of Stephen King. The Shining. No, we already did The Shining, the other snowy Stephen King story. Dreamcatcher. Oh God, no! We're reviewing Misery. In the eighties, King had bigger piles of snow on his desk. Misery, 1990, is classified as a drama and psychological thriller. Ah, back when horror movie was a dirty term. Nowadays, they would call this elevated horror. Directed by Rob Reiner, it is based on the 1987 Stephen King novel of the same name. In 1986, Reiner directed Stand By Me, also adapted from one of King's short stories. Reiner read Misery, and loved it, but King wouldn't sell the rights unless Reiner directed or produced. Reiner agreed, and then hired William Goldman to write the film's screenplay. Luckily, most of the writing was already done. The role of Paul Sheldon was pretty much offered to every leading man in Hollywood, but they all said no. Why? You're getting paid to lay in bed! According to Goldman, leading men hate to be hobbled by their female co-stars. Finally, someone asked James Kahn if he can do it, and he said he can. Angelica Houston and Bette Midler were both offered the role of Annie Wilkes, but both turned it down. It was Goldman who suggested the unknown Kathy Bates, a 42-year-old stage actress. That way the audience wouldn't see a Meryl Streep, but a stranger. They'd only see... Annie. And the rest is cock -a duty history! Paul Sheldon wrote for a living! Now let's watch as he writes to stay alive! This was the first movie produced by Rob Reiner's Castle Rock Entertainment. It's named after the small town in Stand By Me and several Stephen King stories. The second season of the Castle Rock Hulu series follows a younger Annie Wilkes. Writer Paul Sheldon, known for his Victorian romance novels about a character named Misery Chastain, has just finished a new novel. Untitled, and I'm surprised he remembered his own name. A creature of habit, Paul rents the same cabin to write. When he's done, he always celebrates with a glass of wine and one cigarette. Whenever we upload a new video, I celebrate with a two liter of Mountain Dew and one corn dog. Three corn dogs. Armed with his new manuscript that will hopefully keep his career alive post misery, Paul drives away from the Silver Creek Lodge. Speaking of The Shining, Misery takes place in the fictional town of Sidewinder, Colorado, near the Overlook Hotel. Paul is caught in a bad blizzard and crashes his blue 65 Mustang. Well, that's one way to give your manuscript some twists and turns. A nurse named Annie Wilkes finds his unconscious body, so she tongue punches his tonsils and brings Paul to her isolated house. Dang! How strong is she? I'm your number one fan. Uh, an autograph is $30, or 50 if you also want a selfie. Uh, Two days later, Paul wakes up to learn he is bedridden with a dislocated shoulder and two broken legs. Considering what I had around the house, I don't think there's a doctor who could have done any better. Ooh, she lifted that sheet and his fart hit him right in the face. Annie constantly praises his misery novels while feeding Paul pain pills. Open wide. She says the same thing, delivering a suppository. 
Annie promises to take care of him until the roads reopen and the phones are fixed. Meanwhile, Paul's agent calls the local sheriff, Buster, who investigates his disappearance. I'll put his name through our system. If anything turns up, I'll call you right back. That's the system. No wonder I haven't been caught. I guess it was kind of a miracle you finding me. In a way, I was following you. You were following me. Stalking is how you followed famous people before social media. Annie noticed that Paul has a new manuscript over there, and to say thanks, Paul lets Annie read it. It's untitled in the movie, but in the book, it's called Fast Cars. Maybe you can come up with a title. Like I could do that. I can see it now. Like I could do that by Paul Sheldon. However, 40 pages in, and Annie is not a fan. The swearing, Paul. There, I said it. The, uh, the profanity bothers you. Your dialogue makes Quentin Tarantino look like Dr. Seuss. Annie angrily criticizes all the swearing, spilling soup onto the bed. There! Look there! See what you made me do! Yep. The cracks are beginning to show. I love you, Paul. M your mind. Your creativity. Your hair. Your nails. She's saving it all in tiny jars. Some thought director Rob Reiner wasn't right for the job because of his comedy background. However, that's why he wanted the job. He related to Paul Sheldon, who is trapped by his own success and trying to break free from misery. Sheldon is seeking something new, like Reiner, after All in the Family. He is a hell of a director for a meathead. Rip Van Meathead. <laughs> Noticing a broken tree, Sheriff Buster comes so close to finding Paul's buried car. That's one ominous crop dusting. Things get more awkward when Annie buys the first copy of the latest Misery novel and lies about the phones not working. Oh, Paul. What a poet you are. Throughout the film, Annie says, Oh, Paul, 12 times. After eating breakfast, Paul then meets Annie's favorite sow, also named Misery. <laughs> Would you die so I can eat your corpse already? <laughs> what a catch. A nursing degree, and she's bilingual. That afternoon, Annie reveals that when her husband left, she dove into the night shift and forgot all of her problems when she started reading Misery. I'm, uh... Um... Done? Oh, no. He's gonna need three more of those pee jugs. It'd take a pretty special guy to make me want to walk in that aisle again. It boils down to respect. People just don't respect the institution of marriage anymore. They have no sense of real commitment. When she opens that, it's gonna explode! That night, things get worse when Annie finishes the new Misery novel and discovers that she dies. You dirty bird. How could you? Mother, when I wet the bed. I don't want her bed! I want her! Usually a bed only does that if you put a quarter in it. You murdered my misery! Annie. Annie! So, did you like it or what? Flying into a little bit of a rage, Annie reveals that she never called Paul's agent, and nobody knows where he is. And you better hope nothing happens to me. Because if I die, you die. If I can die, and you can die, Everybody can die! James Kahn and Kathy Bates clashed over their acting methods. Bates had a theater background and believed in rehearsing. 
But Khan didn't. Bates felt that Khan wasn't relating to her, and Reiner told her to use that frustration. In the morning, Annie is back to her happy self, and has a surprise. His new story was lacking some sizzle. You must rid the world of this filth. Warner Brothers, when they handed the DC movies over to James Gunn. With God on her side, Annie wants Paul to burn his new manuscript. Paul bluffs, saying his agent already has a copy. But damn it, Annie really is his biggest fan. When you were 24, you wrote your first book and you didn't make a copy because you didn't think anybody would take it seriously. And ever since, you've never made any copies because you're superstitious. You told that story to Merv Griffin 11 years ago. The creator of Jeopardy! Sorry, that's who is the creator of Jeopardy! Annie gestures and pours lighter fluid all over the bed, which is accidental or a veiled threat. Either way, Paul wisely burns the book. Oh my goodness! Goodness gracious! Oh my! He finally thought of a title for that book. Up in flames. While Annie watches TV, Paul tears open his mattress and starts saving those pain pills. I do the same thing with good and plenty. Annie then returns with more surprises, including a wheelchair and a second-hand typewriter. She knows Paul didn't really mean to kill Misery, so now he must write a novel in Annie's honor for nursing him back to health. Misery's return. Misery's return? And I don't think she's talking about Misery's tax return. You just inhale that. I'll be right back. One more surprise. That came out the front. And I got a great deal on this 50 pound clunker on account of it's missing an N. In real life, one of Stephen King's first typewriters was missing the N key. There is just one little issue. The paper she bought smudges, which she takes personally. What's the matter? I go out of my way for you. And what thanks do I get? Oh, you bought the wrong paper, Annie. I can't write on this paper, Annie. I don't need another enema, Annie. But you just better start showing me a little more appreciation around here, Mr. Man. Please, Mr. Man is my father. Annie drives back into town, and Paul notices a bobby pin on the ground, which he uses to unlock his door and explore the house. Liberace did wear some crazy outfits. With the front door locked, Paul makes his way to the back. Here we see the farm penguin and arctic cow living in harmony. Paul finds and grabs even more orange-flavored Tic Tacs before crawling across the kitchen floor to reach the back door. I'm a poet and didn't even know it. <laughs> Me at 3 a.m. looking for a corn dog. Of course, the door is locked. Then, Paul hears Annie's car and quickly rushes back into his room. Paul, you're dripping with perspiration. What have you been doing? Uh, masturbating to, uh, you. Catch this. Mwah! Up in the sky, Buster finally sees Paul's car, and when it's pulled from the snow, he notices the pry marks. You see the dents on the door there? Someone pulled him out. Now he's looking for a coyote with a crowbar. Using Annie as inspiration, Paul begins to write. I see what Annie meant by the swearing. 
and he returns with some notes on what he's written so far, stating it all has to be thrown out. Except for that part of naming the gravedigger after me. You can leave that in. What? Now she gets her own monster truck? Annie then tells a story about going to the theater as a kid and watching the hero die in one of those chapter plays. Cliffhangers. I know that, Mr. Man. They also call them cereals. I'm not stupid, you know. That's not what a little piggy told him. Just before the car went off the cliff, he jumped free and all the kids cheered. But I didn't cheer. I stood right up and started shouting, he didn't get out of the cock duty car! The cock duty car? Who makes that model? Nissan? Misery was buried in the ground at the end, Paul. So you'll have to start there. So Paul does some rewrites, and this time, Annie loves it. Now she must read each chapter when it's finished. Oh, misery's alive! Misery's alive! <gasps> I'm gonna put on my Liberace records. Haven't you tortured him enough? Secretly hoarding his pain pills, Paul wonders if Annie will have dinner with him to celebrate Misery's return. It would be an honor. This occasion calls for a Taco Bell cravings pack. That night, Annie is looking wonderful, and the meatloaf is the bomb! And to give it that little extra zip, I mix in some Spam with the ground beef. Can't get this in a restaurant in New York. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be a health code violation. While Annie fetches some candles, Paul drugs Annie's drink with the pain pills. But the toast doesn't go as planned. Got it. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, I'm so sorry, Paul. I ruined your beautiful toast. To make things worse, the meatloaf gave him diarrhea all night. Speaking of drugs, the film downplays Paul's substance abuse problems in the book. He just got clean, but Annie feeding him pain pills causes a relapse. A lot of Stephen King's main characters have problems with drugs or alcohol. King would often say Annie was intended to be a combination of his scariest fans, but he later revealed Annie was a symbol of his addiction, coming to life, holding him hostage, and trying to kill him. We then get a montage of Paul writing. We see that his body is healing and the snow is melting. In fact, the rain is giving Annie the blues. When you first came here, I only loved the writer part of Paul Sheldon. But now I know I love the rest of him too. A sponge bath after every meal did feel excessive. I have this gun. Sometimes I think about using it. I better go now. I might put bullets in it. That's nice. In the morning, can we have pancakes? With Annie gone, probably taking a pleasant night drive, Paul explores and finds a scrapbook of old newspaper clippings, which is never good. We learn Annie has worked at hospitals in numerous states where patients including several infants, mysteriously died. She's a baby killer. That's awful. Unless you're the guy selling baby caskets. Besides the 11 infants, her victims also include a neighboring family, her own father, her roommate, and many elderly or critically injured patients. Now aware of what kind of monster he's dealing with, Paul grabs a knife before returning to bed and practices his stab. A good skill to have when sneaking up on a Christmas ham. In the night, Annie sticks Paul with a needle and in the morning reveals she knows he has been out of his room. My little ceramic penguin in the study always faces due south. Whose side are you on? Is this what you're looking for? First, I couldn't figure out how you did it. But last night, I found your key. Ooh, keep going. Pull a rabbit out of a hat. 
Paul, do you know about the early days at the Kimberly Diamond Mines? Do you know what they did to the native workers who stole diamonds? Duh, of course! But, uh, tell the audience anyway. They had to make sure the worker could keep working, but also not run away. The operation was called hobbling. Trust me. God's sake! It's for the best. Penny, please! Ah! Oof! How I felt getting a pedicure! God, I love you. Call the NBA! She's over here, snapping ankles! In the book, Annie chops off Paul's foot with an axe. Screenwriter William Goldman argued for it, but director Rob Reiner insisted that it be changed. Goldman later agreed this was the correct decision, as the amputation would cause the audience to hate Annie instead of sympathize with her madness. Sorry, any sympathy ended with killing babies. Why wasn't Annie convicted? Lack of evidence. Oh, it's evident. She's out of her cock duty mind! However, during her trial, she quoted lines from the Misery novels, making her Buster's prime suspect. Has she been uh, buying anything odd lately? Lest you call paper odd. Newspaper? No. Typing kind. Hmm. Buy three items to make a cashier uncomfortable. Rope, a sledgehammer, and cans of Spam! Hi, Pumpkin! How my grandma said hi! In the book, the typewriter's T and E keys also fall out, and when Paul complains about it, Annie cuts off his left thumb with an electric carving knife. Sheriff Buster decides to pay Annie a visit, so she quickly drugs Paul and throws him in the basement. Well, I was wondering, do you happen to know anything about Paul Sheldon? Well, he was born in Worcester, Massachusetts, 45 years ago. The only child of Franklin and Helene Sheldon, mediocre student. Cries like a bitch when you kidnap and torture him! Whoops. You got me. Everything appears to be normal, but on the way out, Buster hears Paul yelling from the basement. And he's dead. Damn, Annie killed Buster quicker than Kubrick slayed Dick. In the book, Annie kills the state trooper by running him over with a riding lawnmower. But Reiner thought this image would have been too comical. I mean, I'm picturing it, and it would have been hilarious! I put two bullets in my gun. One for you, and one for me. Because sharing is caring. Annie's plan is to kill Paul in a murder-suicide, but Paul reminds her they must finish the story so Misery can live. Oh, please! Set her on fire with a fart! I'll fix you something to eat. If it has spam, give me both bullets right now. When Misery's return is finished, Paul needs his three items. Did I do good? This time we'll need two glasses. Oh, Paul. Oh, Paul, you shouldn't be double fisting wine. When Annie returns with the glass, she's horrified that Paul is about to burn the new Misery manuscript. Remember how for all those years nobody knew who Misery's real father was? Does she finally marry Ian, or will it be Winthorne? It's all right here. How George R. R. Martin treats his publisher. Paul, you can't! Why not? I learned it from you. And now everyone will know your secret ingredient for meatloaf. In the novel, Paul pretends to burn Misery's Return and goes on to see it published. In the film, he actually burns it. Reiner suspected King had a fear of not giving his readers what they wanted. However, the director wanted to affirm that Paul was ready to move on. Annie tries to save the pages, but Paul bashes her with the typewriter. 
Nowadays, it'd be hard to bludgeon someone with a MacBook Air. They then engage in a violent struggle. I'm gonna kill you, you lying cocksucker! Whoa, you lying cock a duty sucker! Paul suffers a gunshot wound to the shoulder, but tackles her inches from the goal line. Eat it to yourself, you sick, twisted fuck! The slogan for Old Country Buffet. Paul trips her, causing a dummy to hit its head on the typewriter. <laughs> Paul then crawls out of the room to get to the front door. Oh, shit! For a writer, how does he not know the rules? The killer is never dead. Paul and Annie then fight over a pig door stopper. I'm gonna win the Oscar, and you're not. Now, to steal those Liberace records. In the novel, Paul was missing from winter to spring, but in the movie, he's been missing for about four weeks. Annie is finally dead. 18 months later, Paul, now with Pimp Cane Accessory, meets his agent in a New York restaurant to discuss his new hit book. I'm delighted the critics are liking it, but I wrote it for me. The new book is way, 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 way more profane. Paul then declines when asked if he'd ever write a book about his time with Annie Wilkes. Even though I know she's dead, I still think about it once in a while. Whenever a nurse uses a rectal thermometer. Are you Paul Sheldon? Yes. I just want to tell you I'm your number one fan. Prove it! Empty his pee jug! With a $20 million budget, Misery went on to grow $61 million, finishing second that weekend to Home Alone. Now I want to see Annie kidnap Kevin McAllister. Misery has always been one of my favorite Stephen King adaptations, and it mostly takes place in a guest bedroom. It's a great example of a Hitchcockian thriller. From the opening car crash, the tension grips you like Annie holding the newest Misery novel. Director Rob Reiner expertly crafts an unsettling atmosphere, and that last haunting image of Annie always lingered with me after the credits. Misery is right up there with John Carpenter's The Thing when it comes to claustrophobic, isolated settings. Paul Sheldon is trapped in that remote cabin that might as well be at the South Pole. Where any penguin that snitches gets stitches. The film is elevated by the suspenseful writing and the powerful performances from its two leads. James Kahn's portrayal of the helpless and desperate novelist is raw, gripping, and carried by his expressions. It's more about how he reacts to Annie's outbursts. Kahn may not have been their first pick, but his performance is so good that it's hard to imagine anyone else playing Paul Sheldon. Well, except for all those stage adaptations. Kathy Bates became the first woman to win an Oscar for Best Actress in a Horror Film. In fact, Misery is the only Stephen King adaptation to win an Oscar. Hey, Shawshank Redemption! Suck it! I would like to thank Jimmy Kahn and apologize publicly for the ankles. <laughs> Annie Wilkes is a unique but very grounded and real villain. With the rise of the internet, toxic fandom has only gotten worse, and the hobbling scene is one of the scariest moments in cinema. Right up there, next to seeing Neil Breen's taint. Ah! Bates' portrayal of the unhinged Annie is mesmerizing. Her subtle switch between sweet nurse and crazed serial killer keeps you on the edge of your wheelchair. She's unpredictable, and you never know what she'll do next. So you know, she's collecting your urine and bathing in it. In conclusion, Misery is a fascinating story about fandom, expectations, obsession, isolation, power, control, and ownership. It's the epitome of psychological horror that still holds up. I highly recommend Misery if you've never seen it. 
But be warned, once you enter Annie's home, there's no turning back. Come for the suspense. Stay for the spam meatloaf. It's not just great, it's perfect. Huh, I wonder if we have a number one fan. <laughs> hey, wait, what? Dr. Oddcoitus? Ahoy, hoy, my good boy. You're my number one fan? Oh, no. I'm your number one hater. Hater? But I thought you were helping me. What do you want now? It's therapy time. Last week, you spoke about trying new things, making other videos, but feeling stuck making boots to reboots. That's... that's not true. You know it's time to give the people what they want. Fine. Give me the list and I'll find a remake to cross off. Very good. And to make sure you can work and not run away. Odd Coitus, whatever you're thinking about doing, please don't do it. Trust me, my boy. It's for the best. Doctor, no! <laughs> Don't worry, Andrew. I left your stomping fort. Ah, you hack bastard! I'm not paying for this therapy session! <laughs> God, I hate you. Huh. I guess we should make another Boots to Reboots. We've been Andy, the maniacal cinephile. Thanks for liking and subscribing. Now, go watch one of these videos!